I don't want anyone to ask me what I thought of the film of Captain Corelli, because I've been answering that question for something like 15 years, and I'm sick of it. Michael mentioned Cavafy. Um, it's true that this collection of poetry that I brought out recently is I, it's, it's under his influence, or in his manner, or poetry that I thought he might he just might like. Um, he, he was an Alexandrian poet, uh, in other words, from Egypt, at a time when there were still lots of Greeks in Egypt. Nasser threw them out in the 1950s when Egyptian nationalism uh, reared its head. But there was quite a colony of Greeks in Alexandria. And of course, if you go back far enough, um, the last Egyptian pharaohs were Greek. The Ptolemies were Greek. Cleopatra was Greek. Um, and the language of the whole of the Mediterranean Rim, in fact, as far as India, was Greek. Even the Roman Empire adopted Greek culture, and any educated Roman spoke Greek, as well as Latin, and sometimes in preference to it. So, but all of that is, in a way, irrelevant. Um, Kavafis, well, I think, was born, I think, in, was it 1873, and died in 1933. He wasn't very old when he died, but he was... Uh, he had a very unimportant job working for the British in the third circle of the irrigation office. Sounds like something out of Dante, the third <laughs> circle. And uh, he had actually lived in England for quite some time. He lived in Liverpool. And it is said that he spoke Greek with, a, with an English accent. Um, he was fluent in English. He wrote several poems in English, which are no good at all. They're very formulaic, very sort of bog-standard, bad, late Victorian poetry. Um, in his, he, was, he was gay, and he devoted an awful lot of his time to, for example, to, to, well, frequenting a gay brothel near where his parents lived. He, um, he used to bribe the servants to ruffle his bed up so that his parents wouldn't know where he was, well, specifically his mother. Um, and a lot of his poetry is, is, is about nostalgia for his past loves. Um, he's a, a great celebrator of the erotic life. Um, the other thing is, he was interested very much in the ancient world, about the, the Panhellenic world that I just described, all around the Mediterranean Rim. He, he was an avid reader of ancient histories, and he picked up lots of stories, uh, which he turned into poems or wrote about from peculiar angles. Um, lastly, he liked writing poems in the form of advice. So his most famous poem in Greece is called Ithaca, and it's about how it's more important to journey than to arrive. Um, it's sort of like when you set out on the voyage to Ithaca, make sure your journey is a long one, full of adventures, full of experience, of the Lestragonians, of the Cyclopes, and of furious Poseidon, do not be afraid, for such as these you never shall meet unless you carry them with you before you in your mind. But it ends up with saying, don't be disappointed when you finally get back to Ithaca. You never expected Ithaca to give you anything, really. It was the journey that matters. And I think this was the first of his poems that I ever read and really admired. Now, having said all that, and as Michael told you, I've been reading Kavafis ever since I was about 30 years old. Having said that, by far the greater proportion of the poetry that I've written has nothing to do with him whatsoever. Um, because... I, I've been writing poetry since I was 12, and of course, although it is true that you tend to write the same kinds of things as you read, you must have found this yourselves. Um, you're not nodding wisely in agreement, but you will find that you do tend to write the sorts of things that you read, which is why it's very important to read only good things. Okay. If you want to write fantasy, for example, just read good fantasy novels. Don't read the old rubbish, okay? Um, I especially try and avoid magazines in my house. Um, but ha having said all that, of course, um, one's influences, in fact, come from all over the place. And um, therefore, in my future collections of poetry, I think we'll only have a few things in them which, which are sort of either in the manner of Kvapis or that I thought he would like. Um, I thought I'd start off with one which isn't in the collection and which is a little bit Kvapis-esque. 
Kavafi likes looking back over his life and thinking uh, how it was all lost and possibly uh, a cause of sadness because it was lost. Um, I went to Manchester recently where I was at university um, and I lived in my third year in a house in a place called Wally Range which was at that time the red light district and girls, girls on the streets used to yell at my girlfriend get off the streets you fucking whore because they thought she was competition but I went a few months ago I went back and did a reading at Manchester University and I thought I know what I'll go and look at the old house in Wally Range and this is what came out of it. I think Michael might have seen a version of this. I was going to say, anyway. I hope it's called Days Of. No, it's not called Days Of. <laughs> Kavafis wrote lots of poems called Days Of. So days of 1909, Days of 1906. And I have um, very conscientiously avoided that kind of title ever since Michael started taking the mick about it. But this is called Wally Range, Manchester. I stood before it. That was enough to stir the pot of time, to make its surface, sodden sediment, the grey experience that sank, that house and I forgot. Here rise the gothic gables, the side bricks buff but red in front for the sake of a dignified show. There is the lovely creamy stone that was filthy and black in student days of cracked pane and rotten sash and saucers heaped with butts and ash. Downstairs, I don't know who they were. I don't recall one sight or scratch. Empty, I think it might have been. No heat came up, no smell of food, no voices raised in hate or love. They lived, if they were even there, a life apart from us above. This is the house. I know that single tree. The lawn was lost to weed. All that prospered was a peony sumptuous, regal, worthy of jungle. A rusted bike, a Vincent, lay against the wall. I cleared away the cleavers. I longed to make it work. It crumbled at my spanner's touch. There was no chance, no hope to make it live at all. We lived on rice, on whole grain bread, brick dense, on soy, on anything brown, on roll-ups, coffee, spliff and sex. There was ice in the bath and the basin. On the windows inside there was ice. We took to bed and studied beneath the duvets, coats pulled over our clothes and thick wool hats on our heads. The gramophone sang with Williams and Bream, Rachmaninoff, Dylan, Brahms and Floyd, second-hand records wounded by scratches and clicks. We smoked and talked. There was no TV. We wrapped ourselves and huddled in rugs by the single bar, orange and bright, till the meter ran out and the rain came in. There was Yugoslav Riesling, sweet blue nun, porno plonk sieved from the wine lake of Spain, Matthias Rosé, sparkling and pink, and gutless grass that was homegrown, stale or fake. I'm happy knowing it's made it back, this house, now smart and clean now loved within by prosperous, sensible souls, a place where sun and light returned. This house and I, we parted long ago, and live and prosper now, made new, rescued, restored, granted reprieve, until such time as the wheel revolves, or the thread is cut, and as, befall, as befalls all things, once more our light and sun and fortune leave. I realise that is probably packed with cultural references which would mean absolutely nothing to young people today. However, I'm not bothered. <laughs> you don't live in houses with no heating anymore, do you? With ice on the inside of the window. You don't live on soybeans. Not unless you're a masochist. Anyway, I wrote this about my university girlfriend. This poem took something like 30 years to write. My generation were very keen on finding our true identity, you know, our authentic selves. We read books about people who went to India to discover, you know, the meaning of life. And 
course, as we got older, we gave up on looking for the meaning of life. I have, anyway. But my generation were very keen on it. And uh, one of the things we did, as I say, was travel away a lot. My university girlfriend went to Mexico. And it starts the year after we left university in Brighton. Your Brighton dress. I remember that dress. It was Brighton, a summer's day out in the street, hung on a rack almost above our heads. Your eyes lit up. It was just your kind of dress, heavy fabric, soft and brown, exactly the shade you liked, the color of melancholy, the color of 1979. The year for people like us, a couple without a map, a country with nowhere to go, that had lost the art of laughing, didn't have muscle to breathe. In all the world, I had 12 pounds left, but I bought the dress for your body's sake, for the sake of your eyes' delight. It was a bridge, a perfect bridge for gentle, sweet desires. You loved me for the gifting of the dress. I loved you for your gratitude, your disbelieving face, your little leaps of happiness. I have often remembered how off you went so many months, off in search of yourself. Then back you came, let yourself in with your own key. It was late at night, it was almost dawn. You teased me awake with a kiss. Such slices of time have fallen away. I've scarcely seen you for longer than we'd been alive. It was back in a former life. But I like to remember, false though this may be, that when I woke up and you were there, you were bringing me Mexican presents, wearing a silver necklace, wearing your Brighton dress. Thanks. You don't have to climb, clap. Once you get in the habit of clapping every poem, you have to, you have to clap the ones you don't like. And I had, a, I had this rather strange feeling the other day when I was outside my house on the lane. There was some woodland there. And I had this strange feeling of what, it would, what, what would it be like if I met my younger self? What would I say? What would my younger self say to me? So I wrote this. It's called My Young Self. <laughs> I, was, I was just imagining some of the things that I would put into your mouth. Oh, right. Well, I'll lose some weight. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> My young self. On the way home from the woods, I met my younger self, and great pity seized my heart. I was sorry for his muscled flesh, his unlined face, the hot spark bright in his eyes, the chestnut hair, the beautiful streak of blonde, the spring strong jaunt of his stride. We exchanged greetings. And I decided to stay unknown. I wondered if he suspected. His look was guarded, strange. I said, do you think you know me? And why should I know you, he said. I looked at the trees, avoided his eyes. The rooks above me hurled and flung in the wind. I had so much to say, so much advice, so much sorrow for what would come. One day, I said, you'll meet your younger self on this same road while wending home. The rooks will wheel and call in the Scots pines in the ghosts of the elms. There will be things, an infinite number of things you'd like to say, but you'll walk on instead, back to your home in the woods, leaving your words, all your choice wise words, all your wise advice, unsaid. But this is called Lazarus. And when I rose, confused from the cold stone slab, tight with windings, stinking of myrrh, there loomed the healer's face, still damp from tears, a face I'd loved since first I heard him preach, as we shared our food in the tree's shade, in a silver grove of olives, walled with a well. I'd known him all my life, 
We played together as boys. I hadn't seen him for years, a prophet now in his own land. I was, I know, an idle, flippant, superfluous man. Some hoped he'd drive the pagans out. A magus, others said. But as for me, I went in idleness. I had a friend grown famous and liked to hear what sophists say, what vagrant teachers teach. Caught by surprise, I went to death unwillingly, it's true. But now I'll live, perhaps grow old, compelled anew to weakness, fear and pain, remembering nothing from my dreamless, absent days, decaying in the cave. Master, some years hence, perhaps, or soon, in the self-same fetid hole, once more I'll stretch upon that hard, cold slab, tight with windings, stinking of myrrh. Master, alas for your tender, misplaced love. Master, alas for me, whom you raised up, perturbed once more by the old dread, condemned a second time to drain that dreadful cup. Have pity, Lord, on Lazarus, twice dead. Here's a silly poem. I came across somebody called, um, actually, they, they didn't give his name, but I, I think I came across this in a history by Suetonius about the lives of the emperors, that there was a man in ancient Rome whose willy was so enormous that he became famous for it. And um, so I wrote this about him. Marcus Severus of late memory. Marcus Severus, of late memory, was so prodigiously endowed that when he attended the public baths, the bathers stood and cheered. With modest pleasure, he acknowledged this applause. The jades of Rome, exhausted by pleasure, say, if only Severus had lived, then we'd have something to live for. But the truth is that when he lived, no one remembers ever having enjoyed him. There was a poet I mentioned in the Greek anthology called Leonidas the Tarentine. And uh, he did write a poem uh, addressed to the mice in his house. So this is my version. Leonidas the Tarentine addresses the two mice. Dear mice, respect my trade. I am a poet. Poets need to eat. I have one dirty lump of salt, a little old, and barley cake is all I have for meat. Dear mice, go bite on someone else's cakes, a lawyer or a usurer, innocent of verse, unburdened by philosophy, who dines on hogs and quails, whose stomach never aches. And there was a man called Philotas the Grammarian. Uh, as you can imagine, grammarians were not paid well in ancient Rome or ancient Greece. And he, he, he had a special pair of shoes made of lead, so that he didn't get blown over by the wind. <coughs> he was so fit. Anyway, Philotas the pastoralist and grammarian. <coughs> so thin I grew, poor hermit that I was, so little compensated for my learning and my verse, that friends had leaden sandals made to keep me earthbound when the tempest blew. Scanter still am I, who now in Kos lies dead, the wind of death being undeterred by lead. <laughs> Belfast was, in particular, a terrible mess. In fact, it was very like Manchester when I was a student. Um, Everything was broken, everything was filthy, um, there, were, there were unexpected bomb attacks, um, people lived in a constant state of trepidation and worry. Um, and then, finally, the peace talks happened, and suddenly Belfast blossomed into a lovely city. Um, Belfast is surrounded by black hills, um, which, which sort of look quite sinister, but anyway, it occurred to me that Belfast had been like the princess in the fairy stories who's just waiting for a kiss to wake her up. So I wrote this, I think, in 1998. Belfast at the end of the Troubles. 
By cloud and black hill, the princess sleeps by quiet, cold water. Her soft grey eyes, her fine white skin are dull beneath the dust, cobweb and broken brick, rusted iron and cracked, fire, cracked tile. Brass heart, so I, th I think I'm going to start again, that was rubbish. That's the wine at lunchtime. Okay. By cloud and black hill, the princess sleeps by quiet, cold water. Her soft grey eyes, her fine <coughs> white skin are dull beneath the dust, cobweb and broken brick, rusted iron and cracked tile, brass heart, knuckled hand and idle crane. By cloud and black hill, the princess sleeps unkissed by quiet, cold water. She has dreamed of dragons that grew too real. But light breaks and she wakes at last, smiling and astonished by her long sleep's tears. I wrote this hurriedly on the back of a scrap of paper, so to this day it's called Poem on the Back of a Scrap. <clears throat> Young woman, I see how lovely you are with your black hair and your slick jeans and your fake gold gypsy jewels. Young woman, your mother is with you, and I see how lovely she was, and my heart hurts. And I wonder what man it was who took her beauty to make your beauty. And I wonder what man it will be who will take your beauty, so that one day, in a dark cafe, a man like me will see your daughter and write on the back of a scrap from a file. Young woman, I see how lovely you are. The point of writing uh, unemotional poetry, um, it just becomes an exercise in cleverness, sometimes just a crossword puzzle. I think if a poem doesn't have any kind of emotional impact, I think that whatever you write, whatever you read, what, what, you, what you, you never, never want at the end of something to think, so what? Why did I bother with that? And uh, I suppose the great passion in my life these days are my children. I have two, uh, Robin and Sophie, who are nine and six. And uh, I have them half the time, which means I miss them desperately for half the time. And then the other half of the time, I'm very busy. And uh, for, furthermore, many years ago, I saw a film, a quite a strange film with Keira Knightley in it, um, which I think was about the Roman Ninth Legion, which disappeared somewhere in Scotland without explanation. Have you seen that? The Arthur. Arthur. Yeah. So Arthur. Now, you might remember, there's a Russian actress in it who plays a, 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 a warrior who's an implacable hater of the Romans and slayer of the Romans. And this Russian actress, is, well, she's utterly terrifying. I really hope I never meet her. Um, and one of the characters says of her, her soul is an empty vessel. It can only be filled with blood. You remember that? Her soul is an empty vessel. Um, I was thrilled with this idea, with the soul being an empty vessel. Whenever I try introspection, I see absolutely nothing. I don't know about you, I can't find anybody inside me. Uh, which makes the mission of our generation to discover our true selves was pretty futile. But um, <clears throat> I see nothing. I feel like an empty vessel. And to tie all these loose threads together, here is the poem, which I will, which I will conclude with, and then we can talk. And I see I wrote it four years ago now. Empty vessel. My soul is an empty vessel. With what shall I fill it? With women, with music, with love, with imperishable art? I am weary of all these things, and they are weary of me. I remember when God walked in, stayed for a while, departed, left no card, no number, no forwarding address. I wonder where he went, so pointedly closing the door, making quite sure of the click of the latch, his feet on the gravel, the meticulous click, the counter click of the gate. I don't blame him. It was me that sent him away. It was me that grew faithless. It was me that told him to leave. My soul is an empty vessel. With what shall I fill it? With music, with women, with pride. And then they come, my son, my daughter. I hear their scrape at the door. 
I leap from my chair, I gather them in, tend to their games, their pains, their strange obsessions, their insatiable need to be carried and kissed. The rooms of the house grow bright, the grass of the lawn wakes up, the apple tree braces its boughs. This being so, my heart being full, to hell with my empty soul. I think my life has been marvellous in many ways. I'm, 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 I'm lucky in the sense that I actually can do pretty much what I want all the time now. Um, except I don't have my children half the time, you know, which is, which is a, from my point of view, absolutely dreadful. Um, so even somebody as lucky as me has something to be sad about. Um, but I, I do think... Uh, I, I'm unusually lucky as a writer in earning enough money not to have to do another job. Because let's face it, most people in the arts, it doesn't matter what you are, you can be an actor, a musician, an artist, nearly all of them have to have a, 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 an ordinary job as well to, 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 to help them through. And um, this has been the fate of most people in the arts for thousands of years. So I'm, I'm unusually lucky in, in not having to have another job, although I'm thinking of doing holiday lets. Um, <laughs> so, um, one thing, well there are, there are lots of nice things about being a writer, one is that you actually get to meet your literary heroes. So, when I was, say, your age, there was a Chilean writer called Ariel Dorfman, who wrote, you know Ariel Dorfman? I did, um, Beth and Maiden. That's right, Beth and the Maiden. Now, when I was, when I was, um, I was freshly back from South America, and I was crazy about Latin American literature, and Ariel Dorfman was one of my heroes. And then, what, 30 years later, I get to meet Ariel Dorfman in Canada, and he tells me, I really love your writing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, what could be better than that? <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful. Um, or, I, I can think of many examples like that, of how, uh, um, so, sometimes it strikes me as unreal, that, that, that I'm, I'm actually, on equal terms with somebody who used to be one of my heroes. Um, that, that's really marvellous. But uh, the other thing is that um, when I was younger, I, I did feel awfully alone in the world. There didn't seem to be many people around who were like me, you know, with my obsessions or the, the sorts of things that I liked to do or that interested me. It was lonely. And then in, I think it was the early 1990s, they, the, the, the Granta magazine had a list of what they call the best of young British. And um, I think they chose 20 writers who they thought were the up and coming, you know, uh, good writers of the future. And they, I was chosen as one of them. And obviously I had to go to lots of bashes and parties with these other writers. And I discovered that there actually were dozens and dozens of people like me. It's just I hadn't known them before. And a lot of those people have remained lifelong friends. So. Um, knowing other writers or is, is a way of banishing your loneliness. I think in the same way though, as, as a musician, a, a musician is okay, okay, a musician can function on their own, they can be a good musician, but music really kicks in when you're playing with other musicians. And I, I rather feel like that about any of the arts. You know, an artist needs to knock around with other artists. A poet needs to knock around with other poets. Don't you think that, Michael? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I would have met Michael if I hadn't been sort of on the literary trail. Um, so he regrets that, no doubt. Um, but it was the great moment of your life. It was the great moment of my life. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a downside. If you lack self-discipline, then you're, you're stuffed. Um, I, I, try, I, I do work every morning, but it's only because I, I feel like it. If I didn't feel like it, I would spend all my time lounging around, sort of shopping or staying in bed, you know, like a student. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you, you could you could go down very, hill very quickly if, if you if you were if you, if you had no kind of motivation. Luckily, I have the motivation. Anyone else? Yes. Do you think you're cynical about? Well, sort of lovingly cynical about. Uh, the soul searching of your generation because you did actually try to do it at the time. Oh Christ, yes. I, I actually feel ashamed of my generation. I wrote a poem about it. Um, here it is. Do you mind if I read it? Yeah. 
Because it answers you your see, question. Yeah. This answers your question precisely. This is the hippie generation, right? My parents' generation fought in the Second World War. They saw off the Nazis and the fascists. Their parents saw off the German emperor. What did my generation do? Well, we sat around playing the guitar, basically, and growing our hair. Here we are. This is called We Who Were Born to Live Forever. We who were born to live forever have now grown old. Our joints grind down. Our hair is grey or gone. Our hearts give out and cancers scythe us down. But we were the golden hopeful ones, the ones who'd end the wars, make ploughs from guns. We made love, owned cheap guitars, knew three chords, considered our parents fascists, blamed everything on society, took pompous music seriously, listened to gurus, compared star signs, smoked weed, looked for God in the smoke. <coughs> but we who were born to live forever have now grown old, those of us that survive. We are time's joke. How very beautiful, how sweet, how bright our eyes, how quick and easy our answers, how full of hope, how full of talk, how full of shit we were. <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn Latin at school. So that, that meant I was, I was reading the writings of uh, Julius Caesar or the poetry of Horace, you know, so, so you know, right, right from an early age. I was given the impression that my culture was rooted in the Mediterranean, um, and to a great extent it is. Um, then, of course, I have French ancestors, and so although admittedly they were from Normandy, which is not exactly Mediterranean, but it, 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 having that kind of, having the, the ancestry of an outsider, it, gives, it just gives you the feeling of standing to one side. Does that make sense? So the, the, the one side I stand on is across the channel. And if I didn't live in Britain, I would almost certainly live in France. Um, but I think, I think um, what happened really was that as time went by, I just fell more and more in love with, with Mediterranean culture, and particularly the culture of Greece. Um, it started with the music. I just loved Greek music. And I didn't, I didn't really understand why. I, I do understand now. It, it's because... They use different scales from us, largely, and they use time signatures that we don't very much, like seven, eight, or, you know, uh, um, and I, I found that very fascinating. And because I loved Greek music, sooner or later somebody explained to me that the words of, this, the words of these songs and things were, they weren't traditional folk songs at all, they were the words, they were lyrics written by Greece's best poets. And I thought, wow, they've got the best music with the best poets writing the lyrics. I thought it was the greatest pop music in the world. I'm talking about 25 years ago now, 30 years ago. Um, I think it was, it was that entry through music and then poetry that got me sort of got me rooted in, in that region. And then, because Greece and Turkey are so uh, intertwined historically and culturally, you can't help getting to know Turkey if you also know Greece. And I now actually spend more time in Turkey than I do in Greece. Um, and of course, as time has gone by, I have made friends with, with... I have lots of friends out there, and so I feel perfectly at home. Who's next? Yes? I just wondered if you still write novels as well. Oh, God, yes. No, 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 I... Um, I find that you have different moods. You know, sometimes you feel like making shepherd's pie, and sometimes you feel like making braided fish. It's like that. I have different creative moods when it comes to writing. So, um, I, some, sometimes I just feel like doing a poem, and sometimes I certainly do not. Um, and I would feel much more like writing a novel, or, or, or getting to work on the novel. So what happens is that something, something itches away at you until you have to scratch it, you have to sit down and do it. And I quite like deferred gratification. In the past, I used to wait a couple of days while the idea just festered and annoyed me. And then it was so nice to sit down and write it. And I'm, I'm still like that. And um, I, I've, I'm getting towards the end of an absolutely vast novel as, as we speak. 
Well, I'm hoping to hand it in in April. It's my first family saga. So, uh, but the trouble is, I had the idea for this book 20 years ago, and I've been thinking about it for 20 years, but it begins in 1914. And of course, this year, everybody is doing the bloody centenary of the First World War, aren't they? In a way, it couldn't have been worse timing. Because my publishers are saying, I'm sorry, we've got too much 1914 stuff. You're going to have to do it in 1915. <laughs> so, yes, I'm, and I think that there are two more volumes to come after that. And I have already started several other stories which may turn out to be novels or novellas. So I, I certainly wouldn't give up poetry. I actually, I, I couldn't. Sorry, I wouldn't give up novels. I couldn't give it up. The other day I went out with the children in a storm. I was actually driving around fallen trees. And when we got to, to, to the river valley, the sky was full for about 10 miles with hundreds and thousands of rooks and jackdaws. And what they were doing was having a laugh. They, rooks and jackdaws just love doing aerobatics. Of course, the stronger the wind, the more fun they have. And I, I got home and I wrote a poem called Rooks and Jackdaws. And I didn't realise until the very last, till the end of it, what the purpose of this poem was. Um, which was, seize the day, fly in the tempest for fun. Higher the proportion of the people that you love are dead. If you think about it, it's just a fact of life. Um, gosh, my, the first of my friends to die was only 18. It was an epileptic fit. Um, th there is, I don't know, I could go on about this forever. There's a, there's a good side to the passage of time in that it, t time does heal old wounds. You, you can look back on your past disasters and mistakes. There really does come a time when they actually make you laugh when you look back on them. <laughs> Even though they're intensely painful and you feel like killing yourself at the time. It really is the case that 15, 20 years down the line you'll be laughing about it. Uh, you'll even be remembering with, remembering with fondness people who were utterly vile to you. <laughs> That's very strange. <laughs> your, your desire for revenge disappears and your hatred melts away and they just become a comic episode from the past. That's quite nice. Um, but uh, I think when you talk about time, you necessarily talk about death in the same sentence, don't you? I've often thought that if one really did live forever, one would accomplish absolutely nothing. There'd be no reason to get a move on, would there? You say, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll do it sometime in the next millennium. We would live utterly meaningless lives if it wasn't for that prospect of annihilation forcing us to get a grip on life. You know, um, seize the day, fly in the tempest for fun. Um, and when you, when, you, when you are older, of course, you, have, you hear Time's Winged Chariot hurrying near, and, and, it, and it makes you get on with things. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the news recently a very old novelist called Elizabeth Jane Howard. She died a few months ago, only a month ago. She, and A.S. Byatt is the same as she, Antonia Byatt, who wrote Possession, she, she, she is working so hard precisely because she knows she can't do it forever. So Jane, Jane Howard managed to get a novel out when she was 90. It was the last of a series of novels, The Castle of Chronicles, a long series. She knew she had to do one more volume, and within a month or two of finishing it, well, it had gone through three editions, it was a massive success, and Jane decided it was time to die. So she, she had managed to hold on to 90 in order to get her life's work accomplished. Um, if Jane had thought that she was going to live forever, she probably wouldn't have written the last volume. Um, I don't know. Things do make you wistful. You know, you, you, you look at a, you know, a beautiful young girl and there's, you know there's not the slightest chance she's going to fancy you. That's probably the saddest thing of all. But um, <laughs> on the other hand, you find... I don't know, I, how do you feel about getting, getting, getting older? You, you, the, the way that you love changes, doesn't it? The kinds of people that you love and... That becomes enormously solid and warm and big. It's, yeah. it's very, very comforting and reassuring about life, generally. Yeah. To find what life becomes as you get older. Yeah. 
what happens to the body is a different thing. I was chewing my cornflakes the other morning and there was a tooth in my mouth because it had just fallen out. It had been crowned 20 years earlier and under the crown it had rotted. And there it was in my mouth. That doesn't happen when you're 18. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. It's falling apart. Just do something, will you? Don't stand there. I occasionally get attacks of gout, you know. This is something which is like old drunks are supposed to get. I'm, I'm only a middle-aged drunk. <laughs> it's really not fair. Yeah. Oh, yes, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, I had to do a speech at UEA once where they were giving out the degrees. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was De Montfort. My memory's going. Anyway, they wanted me to make a speech to all these young people. Um, I thought of the sort of things that were said to me when I was young by these generals and admirals and brigadiers and archbishops who came to visit my school and give us, um, give us their thoughts and everything. Um, I thought, oh my God, I've become one of them. <laughs> but what I said to these young people was, if you like hurtling around, if you like playing squash, if you like running, if you like tobogganing, if you, you know, for God's sake, do it while you're young, while your body still can, because when you're older, your body won't let you, and also you won't feel like it. But I don't feel like playing a game of squash anymore. So I'm glad I did it a lot when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry we've rambled on and on. Thank you very, very, very much, Lee. And uh, those of you who are gathered here at this hour will tell posterity um, that they missed one hell of a good reading. Um, but that's their problem, not ours. We were here. So go forth, spread the word, and uh, thank you to Louis for coming all the way from Wilds of Norfolk. Uh, on this rotten, pissy, wet day. So uh, that was beyond the call of duty.